Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're gonna be doing another episode of my do's and don'ts series. And in this one, we're gonna be focusing on painting realistic hair using watercolors. So as you can see here, I will be first going through the don'ts. I'm gonna be going through some things to avoid. This is a very dramatic don'ts. Obviously you might not be doing all of these things, you might be doing one or two, but I am just pulling all of the don'ts into one horrific painting. And I'm also gonna be giving you guys some tips and advice for how you can make your paintings look even more realistic. So firstly, the first don't is you don't wanna mix your colors and just apply them to your paper without actually testing them first. So here I have mixed the color and I'm doing a very blonde hairstyle, but I didn't test that color on scrap piece of paper first. I just went in, mixed the color and applied it straight to my final study. But what you do wanna do is instead, you do wanna test your colors and keep mixing them until you get a color that you're happy with. So for example, if I was to mix a color and just apply it to the paper, you can see that if I was doing a blonde hair tone, this is very golden, very sort of bright, vibrant, too artificial looking, and it doesn't look natural. Whereas if I had gone ahead and tested the color, then you can see that I can keep tweaking until I get a color and a wash that I'm happy with. I've made the wash a lot lighter, a lot more diluted, and a lot more of a natural blonde tone. And I was only able to get to that final result by testing and keep tweaking the mixture and adding water to get it light enough as well. So you can really see the amount of variations I've gone through to get to that final color. So it's really important that you test out every new color that you're applying to your painting on a piece of scrap paper first. I use a little scrap piece of the watercolor paper that I'm using, but you can just do it on any paper you want, but it's gonna be more accurate if you use the paper that you're working on. So the next thing that you don't wanna do is you don't wanna use a very cheap paper. You can see that on the don't side, the paper is really absorbing that watercolor as soon as I put it down. And that's because it's not watercolor paper. And you can't really mix the watercolors around if you're not really using a paper that's meant for that purpose. So when I did the don't side, I'm basically using a piece of paper that's just out of a sketchbook, just normal cartridge paper, printer paper. But on the do side, I always like to use my Archer's Hot Pressed Watercolor Paper. This is their 140 pound paper. And you don't have to get this one, but just try and get a really nice quality watercolor paper or a paper that is meant for wet mediums because we are gonna be working with lots of layers and you don't want it to warp or buckle or rip and tear or just absorb all of the paint like it was doing here. And the next thing that I'm doing incorrectly with this don't piece is I'm not really using a size paintbrush that is suitable for what I'm doing. At the moment, I'm trying to add a base sort of color to the hair, a very light wash, but because I'm using a very small brush, it means that I have to keep going in and picking up more paint and it gives it more of a streaky look. So I like to use different size brushes for different sort of purposes. The larger brushes are better for covering large areas and adding more basic washes of color, but then you can use your smaller round brushes for more detailed work. They're not gonna be as good at covering large areas, but they are better for the detail because it's hard to use a large brush to get detail. So now let's start with the do side. And the first thing that I'm doing is I am applying a base layer of the watercolor, a very light wash to the hair. And because this is a blonde hairstyle, I started off with a very light blonde shade and I did test it out before I applied it to the painting. And I just picked a color that was very similar to the color of the highlighted pieces of hair. And it's always best to start off with a very light wash and then you can build up to darker colors. But you can see that I'm using a much bigger brush as well to apply this base layer. It's just gonna make it so much more efficient. The next don't is really important and that is you don't wanna go and add a second layer of watercolor if your first layer is already wet. And I'm gonna show you a little demonstration of why it's important to let your layers dry. So I'm just gonna be applying a very light tone. I've applied it to two separate swatches. And on the left hand side, I'm going to show you what happens if you add a darker layer without letting the previous layer dry. You're gonna see that when I try and add some more details and add another shadowed layer, the new strokes just bleed into that first layer of watercolor. Everything just bleeds out so you're not gonna get really nice defined strokes that you're doing for the hair. It's all just gonna bleed in together and there's gonna be no definition there. When you're painting hair, you want nice, crisp, clean lines when you're doing your different hair strokes. So the wet and wet method is not the best one to use in this case. 
The wet and wet method is so good if you do want to get that blurred out look, but that isn't what we're going for in this study today. So what you do want to do is wait between each layer, wait for it to dry completely before you add a new layer. You'll see with the swatch on the right hand side, I have waited for it to completely dry and the lines are a lot cleaner, a lot crisper, and you can really see the definition in each stroke that we've done. There's no bleeding out at all in this case, and that's really good. It's gonna allow you to keep more control. If it's bleeding out, then it's hard for you to control your strokes and get that look that you're going for and get all of those individual hair strokes in and those flyaway hairs, because you can see on the left hand side, it just bleeds out everywhere. The next thing that you wanna avoid doing is going in circular motions or back and forth motions and really overworking that paper. You wanna go in lines. If you're painting hair, you wanna get that hair texture. So you do wanna build it up in lines. When you're doing like a face or skin, then you might be doing circular motions instead. But if you're painting hair or fur, then it's best to go with the direction the fur or the hair is going in and build it up in strokes and lines rather than doing any other like circular motions or anything like that. Moving back over to the do side, you can see that now that I'm adding the base layer for the roots of the hair, the slightly darker color, you can see that I'm going with the direction that each section of hair is going in. It's really important to look at the hair in terms of sections and clumps and locks of hair rather than loads of individual, painting loads of individual strands of hair. Build it up in terms of the shapes and then add details over the top afterwards. So the next don't is you don't wanna outline the sections of hair. As you can see here on the don't side, I'm just going around those sections in the plaits and I'm not really building up too much detail, I'm just outlining everything. And that's okay for different styles, but because we're talking about realism, outlining your subject matter is not gonna give it a realistic look, it's gonna give it a very cartoony look, in fact. And you don't wanna be going for a cartoony look if you're trying to paint realism. So avoid outlining the sections of hair, instead, build up the details, build up the shadows that you can see, look at each section of hair individually and identify where are the shadows within that section of hair and where are the highlights. And I always slowly build up from a very light wash to darker washes you can see that I'm not outlining the different sections of hair. I am looking at where the transition in values are. And in the reference image, in real life, hair is not outlined. So just look at where the series of shadows and highlights are in each lock of hair and keep working in lines that are going and flowing with the direction of the hair to build up that structure. I'm also glazing more colors over the top. I keep tweaking and adjusting the colors and building up using different washes of color. And between each wash, I am waiting for it to dry. If you wanna speed up the process, then you can go in with a hairdryer and use a hairdryer for a minute or two and that will allow it to dry so that you can go onto the next layer. And you can see that I am working very slowly. The do side took me actually about five hours. So it was a very slow process, but it's because I really wanted to make sure that I'm not rushing it, I'm not rushing the amount of layers that I do, I want to make sure that I'm getting lots of different values in there, the lighter washes and then those darker washes as well. It's important to have those darker tones in and really make the shadows as dark as they need to be so that the hair does pop. Generally, within each section of hair, the shadows tend to be on either end and the highlighted area is more in the middle. And when I transition from the shadowed areas of the hair to the more highlighted areas, what I do is I take my paintbrush and I create strokes that are going from the shadowed end towards the middle, towards the highlighted end. And as I get towards the highlighted area, I gently feather off those strokes with my paintbrush and I feather them off at different points so that you have more of a staggered look so it's not a really harsh cut off as to where your shadows are and then where your highlights area of the hair are. It's more of a nice gradual change and that will give you a much more natural and realistic look. Another thing that you really want to avoid doing is overworking your paper, especially these cheaper papers. You can see that sometimes you might go in with tissue to lighten up the colors, but in this case, if you use a cheap paper, it's just going to damage it so much that it will probably just rip. So it's really worth investing in the better quality watercolor paper. As I progress with the do side, I am not changing up anything with my technique. The only thing that I'm changing is that I'm mixing darker versions of the same color. So mixing up darker versions of that brown. And to do that, I'm just adding less water to the mixture. And then once I'm happy with the shadows and the basic structure of the hair, it's time to add the details. So I mix up 
varying dilutions of a very light brown color so I've got a light brown with more water in and then slowly going over to a more concentrated brown and I use this to add flyaway hairs now with your hair painting the hair study is going to really go up to that next level and look so much more realistic if you add in flyaway hairs and little details so what these are are basically hairs around the outside of the hairstyle and over the top of the hairstyle really just to break it up so it's not so uniformed so it really has that natural look to it because hair is only not going to have these if it's really slicked down but most of the time it's not going to be so there's going to be those few little stray flyaway hairs and because we've been working at it in terms of sections and not been doing lots of individual hairs it's important that you do go in as well and create a few individual ones just to like I said really break it up a bit and I'm going in with those different washes of color starting off with a very dilute color and this will give you very very light subtle flyaway hairs and then as you build up to those dark flyaway hairs you're going to have different values so you're going to have flyaway hairs that are more set back and are really light and then other ones that are darker that are going to grab your attention more so this is going to give the look of depth and layering in your hair study so those are my tips for painting realistic hair in watercolor. If you do want to see this whole study and two others in real time, then I have got them over on my Patreon available for you guys now so that you can follow along with me in real time and really see in depth my techniques. I have also got over 200 other real time tutorials available for you guys over on there right now that you can get access to for just a small amount per month for lots of different mediums and different subject matters. Anyway guys, that is it for this video. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more tip and tutorial videos if you're new around here. But that is it for me and I'll see you in the next one.